Welcome to another episode on the People Productivity Channel, a place where you can become the best you. On this channel, we host real people with real stories about the human experience and how it impacts their life, their success, and the people around them. Today, I have a really, really interesting guest, somebody who actually gets the customer human experience better than just about anybody I know. He spent his entire life working on this, Richard Shapiro who is also the president and founder of the Center for Client Retention. Hang on, I think you're gonna really enjoy this interview. There's a lot of wisdom that is gonna be shared today, things that you can apply in your own life because everybody's human and in some ways, everybody is your customer as well. So Richard, look, yes, that, Frank. thanks for joining. You know, uh, love having you on. I was thrilled you, uh, given your busy schedule and all the things you have going on, uh, that you were willing to make time to come on on, on this channel. So no, Frank, nope. I, I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, I've known you and Jack for a long time and, uh, I'm always, I'm always here to help people. And that's what, that's what the world is about. Yeah. I mean, you are such a human person and you care about others so much. You know, I was super impressed about that at the time I met you. <clears throat> and then, you know, when I read this book, you know, the endangered customer. I like that cover. Yeah, which I tell you what, it it's just, it's a great recipe book for keeping the customer. And I think everybody should get a copy and read it because it's real. It's just not a bunch of, you know, trite research. It's real life experience and what matters. So, you know, tell the audience a little about yourself. Sure. Um, and just one uh, thing specific to the book and how timely it is, I, uh, I'm very proud that I'm adjunct professor at the Fashion Institute of Technology, and uh, my textbook actually is the core of the course. And I asked my students, because the book came out in 2016, is it a timely book? And they said, absolutely, positively. Uh, it works whether it's for uh, voice interactions, you know, telephone interactions, electronic interactions, or face-to-face. -face. So thank you for uh, showing the book, and uh, um, um, I'm glad I wrote it, and hopefully I'll be writing some more books as well. So uh, once again, thanks for the, uh, you know, introduction. Yep. Uh, usually I start almost any interview or talk uh, I like it to be a story, and uh, I think the story starts when I was about eight or nine years old. My dad owned a small men's retail clothing store in northern New Jersey, actually in West Anglewood, New Jersey. And starting at eight, eight, starting at age eight or nine, you know, I worked at my dad's store every Saturday. So every Saturday, my friends were playing stickball, soccer, or touch football. But every Saturday, I got dressed in a suit, drove to work with my dad, and didn't come home until the end of the day. And my job was being the cashier. It was a small store. Yeah. But the beauty of it is that I could see my father interacting with every customer that went through the door. And three important things I learned from my dad is, number one, he saw all customers as people first, customers second. Let me repeat that. Mm -hmm. He saw all customers uh, as people first. Second, he welcomed everybody into the store, just like he'd welcome them into our home. You know, to my dad, uh, the store was just an extension of our home, another place to make people feel welcome. Mm -hmm. And the last lesson, which I feel is really carrying out his legacy in my business and life, is he taught me the importance of and how to create an emotional bond with each customer from day one. Yeah, phenomenal. And uh, that so inspired you that, you know, you went on to live a life serving customers. Now, I know you spent a lot of a lot of time in your early in your career at ADP. Why don't you share a little bit about that with the audience? Sure. Uh, well, most people know ADP today. Uh, but when I started, I never heard of ADP uh, because it was almost a startup. Matter of fact, uh, when I began my career, I was going for my MBA at Fairleigh Dickinson mm -hmm. University and decided that, you know, I no longer uh, wanted to really be or need to, needed to be a full-time student. So yep. I went to a, um, uh, you know, employment agency and I said, listen, I want to get a job and I'm willing to take one day pretty much to do it. And in those days, you could take one day. Um, so they sent me up with two interviews. One was ADP in the morning and the second was Teneco in the afternoon. Uh, ADP offered me the job on the spot and ADP at the time, the revenues were 40 million. 
Uh, when I left 18 years later, they were uh, 4 billion, and today they're about $14 billion. And one specific statistic that a lot of people don't know about is that ADP is the only company that has this record, over 165 consecutive quarters of double-digit earning growth, which is for over, it's actually over 41 years. Uh, and in 1996, I did a presentation at Emory University at the Center for Relationship Marketing on the success of ADP, even though I was out of ADP uh, for a while. But very good culture, if you want to talk about culture in the beginning. And, uh, uh, yeah, I'd love to. Good. Very I'd love lovely. to actually, I, was, I hadn't thought of that angle for this call because I was going to really focus on the customer and I'd gone back through your book and, you know, was excited to talk about what's in the book because it is so relevant. But yeah, look, I love cult, company culture, obviously. It'd be great to talk about what made ADP's culture so incredible that people could apply today in, in their own workplace. Sure. Uh, well, number one, um, People worked hard, and they had a lot of fun. I mean, uh, I was very lucky that, you know, I was able to form an entire department eventually of about 400 people uh, as I become general manager, one of the largest regions at ADP. And in a lot of cases, I was the final person who would be interviewing. So uh, I hired a lot of people. They, a lot of them were like me, but I also hired people that weren't like me. Um, but I think the... You know, there were so many important lessons, but retention uh, was always talked about. Josh Weston, who was one of the most successful CEOs in the history, probably, of corporate America and specifically ADP, at every town hall, he would talk about not only customer retention rates for the overall business, but yeah. also for first year accounts, because in any business, generally, you have higher attrition for your first year customers because people don't know how to onboard them and things like that. So there were so many lessons I learned and the culture was great and it was a lot of fun and uh, fun, but always a focus on retaining customers. Yeah. It sounds like uh, Josh was ahead of his time <clears throat> and he was. really got it. He, he was a numbers guy. Uh, just one little tidbit. He was also an expert. Not everybody might agree with this with time management so uh -huh. when Josh called you to the office, and he didn't call me to the office too much, it was never like 10.30 or 10 o'clock. It was 10.02, 10.07, 10.22, and you'd actually have three people lined up. They were waiting outside his office, and then he'd call you in exactly at 10.23. So he knew how to take that hour and divide it up into 60 minutes. Very efficient. Guy. Wow. That's, that's pretty amazing. I never came close to doing that, I must say. <laughs> you know. Uh, no, he, matter of fact, uh, at the time, uh, probably when I was 25 or 26, I ended up buying uh, a new Cadillac at the time. And I was at a gas station. And of course, in New Jersey, where I was living, you know, people pumped your own, I mean, that, sorry, you had somebody who pumped, pumped your gas. But one day I was sitting there waiting for the uh, service attendant uh, to come out. And sure enough, Josh pulled up in his Chevy Impala, got out of the car, pumped his own gas and, and went on. So. Wow. I, I, I bent down into the car a little bit, so he didn't see me. <laughs> so he saved two minutes. Yes. Right? I mean, incredible. Incredible. Wow. What, a, what an incredible track record, though. 41 years of consecutive double-digit earnings growth. Quarter, quarter by quarter. Quarter. That, <clears throat> I, I just, uh, yeah, that has to be unsurpassed. That is phenomenal. So that says a lot. Yeah. And, so, and I... Yeah, just one other thing too. I, I think that um, people really did care about their clients, but tying it into incentive programs, a lot of people don't don't believe in incentive awards, but I think that they do work. And I remember once we had like a bank book program where the AEs were account executives were probably making about you know an average of twenty thousand dollars a year at the time, and uh, we created a bank book where they got started with like $10,000 in this bank book. And uh, what would happen is during the year, every time they lost an account, they'd lose 10% of the revenue. So if it was a $20,000 account, they'd lose $2,000 from their bank book. But every time they set up an account, uh, they would gain 1%. So they would gain only $200. So it absolutely had a focus on retention. And I'll tell you, if there was a problem with an account, these people would jump in their car, 
go to see the account, make sure the, pro the problem was solved. And of course, there weren't cell phones and email that day, but believe me, they were on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, that story, I remember when we uh, got together, you were telling me a story, this is probably two years ago, about the person who was working at Southwest and jumped in the car to go deliver the medicine. Do you remember that? No, no, I, I, I don't remember that, but... Uh... But it was, a, it was a, a cancer drug that mm -hmm. had gotten like diverted and maybe the woman left right. it on the plane. I don't know, but the Southwest attendant got the call and at 2 a.m. drove an hour to deliver this to the client. And when you talked about people driving out to the customer, you know, so concerned about the customer, you know, these companies that have great service like an ADP or a Southwest, you see that happening. People take it, you know, take complete ownership of that customer experience. And it's amazing, really. I love this savings book, about, you know, the bank account. I've never heard that particular incentive program or tactic, and that's powerful, boy. No, no, it was. Listen, uh, the other day I went to, uh, you know, my local grocery store, we live in Manhattan, and uh, the cashier asked, you know, which a lot of cashiers will ask, did you find everything you were looking for? And uh, this person said, well, yes, except for one thing. Well, literally, this cashier jumped over the aisle, took him by the hand, went to, uh, the, to the, the aisle, found it for her, you know, found it for him and went back to her, to her post. I mean, you just don't see things like that, you know, yeah. anymore, but it was an amazing experience that, that I, I captured certainly in my mind. So. I mean, that's an incredible, uh, incredible experience. You know, you have, you have such deep experience and, you know, you haven't written just one book, you wrote two and your first book, The Welcomer's Edge laid out a relatively straightforward three-step process for really creating this human connection. Why don't, why don't we start there? Maybe you could just share that very simple process with, with our audience. Sure. Uh, well, one day when I was lying on the beach, and I actually know the day, it was uh, July 1st, 2007, I was thinking about my dad and how he would welcome everybody into his store. So mm -hmm. I decided that uh, he was very special, uh, and even though he had passed away so many years before, that I had two recent encounters, one at Gold's Gym and one at a, uh, a local hardware store yeah. where I had just bought a 99 cent fly swatter. And I was thinking how, just for 99 cents, how well I was treated by this person, Bob. So I said, oh, I got Bob for the fly swatter. I have Adam at Gold's Gym. I was just signing up for a temporary summer membership and I had my dad. Could I possibly put a name to those people, so I decided to call them welcomers. Not greeters at Walmart, but people who automatically like to welcome and engage and were curious. And then I thought about it, is it possible that I could classify all service and sales providers into different categories? And I came up with four on the beach. Welcomers, hmm. robots, indifference, indifferent or indifference and hostile. But of course, I'm a research person, so I couldn't write a book without proving my hypotheses. Yeah. So the next three years, I spent uh, researching that, you know, not full time, but every time I went on vacation, went into a store, went on business trips, and the categories came out absolutely the way, they, the way I first envisioned them. And what's really terrific is that welcomers are only a small percentage uh, of the population, Robots are the largest. They go through the motions, but they don't always have the emotions. Yeah. But the good news in all this is that a large percentage of the robots could actually be taught to be trained to act like a welcome, to think like a welcomer and act like a welcomer. So their behaviors and their thought patterns could be changed. Indifferent and hostiles, get rid of them, put them in the stock room. I don't, I don't care what you do with them. Yeah. Uh, but they should never interface you know, with the customer. So that's how I developed uh, the book in the first place. And then leading to my second book, the other part of the book, which was only in one chapter, uh, was I, I realized in evaluating and observing all these welcomers mm -hmm. that they instinctively segmented their interaction into three components, the greet, the assist, and mm -hmm. the leave behind. 
So it was a great concept and, you know, I'll flush it out a little bit when we talk about the endangered customer. Yeah. Uh, but it is the key to retaining customers. Yeah. So we'll go through that as we go through the eight steps that are really, you know, in the, in the book, the endangered customer, before we get into that, I think it's important to talk about why this matters so much now. Um, and what's at stake in the economy. And I, I like to go back also to the fact that even if you work in a company and you support another part of the business, they're a customer and they're human. And, you know, they have very similar needs. So uh, these lessons are important for everybody. I really believe that in an economy where, you know, it's so much more human. But why does this matter so much now? What does the research show? Well, the research shows that. Um, you know, according to Accenture, we're in the switching economy, which means that, uh, and they've been analyzing this since 2010, that customers are more, are less loyal because they have more options, you know, basically. So they have more, it's a, a perfect storm. They have more options and they're less loyal. I'm just going to take some water for a second. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll do the same. <laughs> So the point is, so if they have less, uh, if they're less loyal and they have more options, what's the glue? I mean, every, every business <clears throat> periodically is a problem. But if a customer has a relationship with a specific person at the company, they're less likely to look for an alternative. So um, I think it's critical that I always say the strongest bond is between two companies, uh, I'm sorry, two people. And in the business world, uh, a lot of companies do that by setting up, you know, account managers, mm -hmm. but in many cases, those account managers uh, change jobs or they leave the company or they get promoted. And every time the account manager is changed for a client or the contact within the customer or client is changed, basically you're going back to zero. So it's so important that every time a contact changes at your company or at the client site that you treat it as a brand new company and start to create that relationship at once. So, um, you know, in the business world, people will tell me, oh, you know, I never lose a client. I've had Bank of America for years. Uh, well, maybe they did have Bank of America for years, but maybe Bank of America is giving all their new business to all their competitors. So retention is not just about retention. It's also about increasing market share with your existing customers. Mm -hmm. Very important. And that switching economy, I think Accenture said was $6 trillion or something, something like that. Right, exactly. So we're talking about something that is so vitally important in this economy in an era where anybody could go online and buy anything. There is so little loyalty to build loyalty. Wow. What could be more important than that? Nothing is more important. Yeah, nothing really. Uh, Cause the cost of a new customer is so much higher than keeping one. Right. And you know, it used to be like, uh, you know, six times as much. It, it's, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's probably a lot more because everybody says that to actually get a customer now through social media is extremely, you know, expensive. Uh, so it, it, it just doesn't, you know, make sense. Uh, and, uh, as the ADP learning about the new account, when you have a new account, whether it's a, a cleaner or whether it's a restaurant or whether it's a linen service for a restaurant during that first year, uh, you have to have all your guns, you know, loaded and make sure that the service delivery is perfect and that you create a relationship and it continues. Yeah, and maintain it. And, you know, when one of the key people with a relationship changes to treat that customer like they're a new customer, that is, that is really, really a great insight. Because I don't see people doing that, honestly. No. I, no. I think you're the customer and, you know, we could switch the relationships and it's not really going to matter. And in fact, nothing could be further from the truth, right? No, I think one of the examples, it's a retail example, but I call it the handoff. Uh, you know, for years I was buying at Nordstrom's. And of course, I was buying from Ruth, who was my favorite person. Ruth knew when I was going on a speaking circuit. She knew that my kids lived, uh, worked in the, in the local pizza place. Mm -hmm. uh, she knew my wife. 
she knew everything about me. And then one day, Ruth calls up and says, listen, I just want to let you know that I'm moving to Florida and uh, uh, I loved having you as a customer. I know you're going to be disappointed. I'm going to be disappointed too, but I'm sure the next time you walk into Nordstrom's, you're going to find somebody. And Nordstrom is, is known for excellent service. Yeah. And the next time are. I walked into Nordstrom's, all the people were professional, but as far as I was concerned, my Ruth was gone. And that was the last time that I ever, ever walked into Nordstrom's again to buy anything. And I think the lesson there is not that it's Ruth's fault, but if Ruth had rewind the clock, if Ruth, Ruth had said to me, listen, I'm leaving, but I found the perfect person for you, Joe. Come on in. Let's have coffee. Joe, yeah. uh, you and I will meet. I'll tell Joe exactly what you like. And it's possible I'd still be shopping at Nordstrom's today. Yeah, you're right. Uh, that would have made such an incredible difference, that personal touch. And she would have started the relationship off. Right which uh, is amazing. <clears throat> but that happens in so, the consumer world and the, and the business world as well. So I think everybody on this particular show sh listening in should want to actually really pay attention because you're going to get into how to keep your customers, customer retention. So <clears throat> it's a great book. Why don't we go through these eight steps? Because this is really, really, really important. You talked a little bit about step one. Make me feel welcome. That's, that's a human interaction. How do you do that? Well, uh, that's an excellent question. But before I answer that yeah. question, I just want to uh, explain the structure a little bit. Sure. I think it's important. Uh, give you a little background that uh, the eight steps that I developed all are tied into human emotions. That, that's why they work. And they're also mirrored uh, uh, on a famous uh, psychotherapist called Eric Erickson. So Eric Erickson developed this formula or process for human development. And uh, even though he has eight steps, they're not exactly my eight steps, but three of the components pretty much uh, match up with my uh, greet system, leave behind. And that's hope trust and intimacy. Mm -hmm. And what people really don't talk about is that nobody walks into a mall or, or wants to do business with a, somebody or, or gets married or, or God forbid they're sick and they're looking for a doctor. They're hoping that whoever that person is can help them. So it's tied into my first step of making someone feel welcome. That they go into your business hoping that you can solve an issue or make them happy or make a great party if you're a party planner or whatever. And that hope will either be fulfilled or diminished in the first few seconds. If they, don't, if they aren't made to feel welcome, uh, if you don't acknowledge them as a person, then they're going to uh, uh, lose that hope. But if they think you can deliver that hope, then the next step uh, is the trust, you know, do you have the expertise, uh, the knowledge and, and know how to ask them the right questions. And the last thing, and then we'll go back to the eight steps because it's so critical, especially mm -hmm. in the B2C world is intimacy. How do you show your customers that you care about them after the transaction is over? I guarantee you that almost anybody would say that in the B2C world, whether it's a restaurant, a hotel, uh, a retail store, nobody shows the customers that they care about them. Sending them spam emails twice a day Ugh. does not show them that they care. So anyway, the first step, make me feel welcome, is all about whether that hope is either fulfilled or diminished within the first few seconds. And, it, and it's a critical component. Now, one of the things that I suggest, uh, and it works like perfectly, especially over the phone, if someone calls your business, as soon as someone calls your business and they're hoping that you can possibly help them, don't start asking them questions. The first thing you should say to them is, I can help you with that. But do you just mind if I ask you a few questions? When you say, I can help you with that, and that help might be you have to get back to them, you have to talk to your boss, you might even have to refer them to a competitor, but that fulfills that hope. Mm -hmm. Simple. Yeah, a simple way to just ignite that connection, right? right. To make it I real. Have to be one of the shortest words in the English language that I always 
say that has the greatest impact? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so we get this first step, which is make me feel welcome. And um, what do you recommend when you're actually doing it face to face? Because a lot of interactions, you know, are still face to face. Many are over the phone. Some of them are electronic. Yeah, well, it's the same approach. Um, listen, when, when you walk into a, a restaurant or you walk into a store, uh -huh. uh, you know, it, it works. I mean, you know, if, if you walk up to a hostess stand at a, at a restaurant or if you walk, if you uh, uh, bring your coat, you know, to the coat check, yeah. uh, you know, when someone says right away, you know, when you... If, if someone asks you, do you have a reservation? You know, I mean, that could be a turnoff. But if someone's, if they say, oh, I'm here for dinner, oh, I can help you with that. You know, yeah. And if they say they don't have a reservation and the, res and the restaurant is full, uh, you can see possibly if you can do something or if there's another time. Or what I like to do, which is in this particular case, which is all about helping people and really looking at the future, saying, you know what, I'm sure you're disappointed and we're disappointed too. But maybe there's a special occasion where you'd love to come here. Why don't you call me personally in advance and I will make sure that I make the reservation and you sit in the, you know, the best section here. So don't, don't treat every interaction as a single interaction like you're never going to see the person again. If you treat it like that, you are never going to see the person again. So. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, these, these things, these touches, you know, these little things make such a difference. No, ab absolutely. You really, really um, do. Uh, there is a, but getting back to just the phone for a second, there's a law firm uh, that's a client of mine. He yeah. said his business changed because of the I can help you because he merged with another company that had a different practice area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he knows that his people, if somebody said, can you do this? They would have said no. And I mean, no, but, well, no, people don't like to hear no, but. And yes. Instead, now they say, "Oh, I can help you with that. Let me refer you to such and such." It makes a big difference. It makes a big difference. So, you know, the first thing, obviously, now they feel a little welcome. What's the uh, second step then? The second step is give me your full attention, but that's not just listening uh, to what people uh, said. It's listening to the underlying feeling. Matter of fact, at ADP, out of all the courses that I took, active listening was the most important. So. Mm -hmm. So many times people are frustrated, they're concerned, they're disappointed. They also could be excited. Uh, you know, how many times does someone go into, uh, maybe they're building a new house and they go into a, a furniture showroom, they're probably excited. So if someone says, oh, I'm building a new house and, you know, I'm looking for new furniture and if they're excited, if the salesperson says, you know, you sound so exciting, it is exciting that you're doing this, I'm glad I can help you and things like that, it makes such a difference. And I always tell anybody, you never can, you can never get it wrong. If you say to someone, I hear you're disappointed, you know, that we, you know, that we're, the product is late and they're really angry. They're going to say to you, you know what? I'm not disappointed. I'm angry. And then all you have to say is, well, I hear you're angry. Uh, let's, let's resolve the problem. So, mm -hmm. so it's not just listening once again to what people are saying. It's how they're feeling. And everybody has an emotion. I mean, most interactions have some kind of emotion impact to it. Yeah, yeah. And um, people should tune into that and make sure the person understands that you know or care about how they feel, right? Right. So now, um, you know, you, you know they're angry. Um, or now, we move on. <laughs> now we move on to the third step, right? Answer more than my question. Yeah. Um, answer more than my question. There's no way you can engage and build a relationship with, with a customer unless uh, you ask them a series of questions to further engagement. Uh, but one of the, uh, I'm not going to call it a trick because it's not a trick, but I, I had to uh, change the way I said it, say it myself, is never, never ask the customer, do you have any other questions? Never ask an open, I mean, never ask a closed-ended question. Always say, what other questions do you have? Because psychologically, when you say, do you have any other questions? People think that you only have time for one more question. But when you say, what are the questions that you have? You're probably going to get three more questions. And those three questions, a lot of times can help convert a prospect into a client or a client into additional business. So 
engaging the customer is important and one of the best ways is to try to ask as many questions as, as, as possible. Yeah, and there is a real art to that, right? To, you know, establish a rapport and just, you know, know how to ask, you know, question after question. I love that, you know, instead of ending it, right? Do you have any other questions which kind of draws the line in the sand? And I think people do that all the time. I, I, the other part to this is that every purchase has a story. Every person, and when I have a story, and when I always tell, I, you know, I teach FIT and I teach my clients, it's your job to uncover the story. If you uncover the story, you're going to be able to do a much better job. And I was doing a panel at the Javits Center and uh, uh, the publisher of, uh, or editor of Accessory Magazine was on the panel and, and the panel actually was about my book. Uh, and they also had some retailers there. Mm -hmm. And uh, Karen said, I just want to let you know that Richard is 100% correct. Uh, I was going to be uh, having a new photo shoot and I wanted a new outfit and uh, I love this particular outfit. And the salesperson said, well, why do you need a new outfit? And she said, well, because I'm going on a photo shoot. And he said, you know what? If you're going on a photo shoot, this outfit is not going to photograph well at all. And she said, if he didn't find out why, yeah. I would have bought the wrong thing and, and it wouldn't have been a good experience. Yeah, yeah. Amazing, right? Uh, that type of interaction. And there is, uh, you know, an individual that, you know, cared. Wanted Absolutely. To connect, wanted to understand the story. And that's a great, easy way to think about this, right? To know the underlying story. Right. Everything has a story. Yeah. To every purchase. There right. is some underlying story motivation, what's happening. You know, just incredible. Um, then, then we get into uh, knowing your stuff. Yes. Well, knowing your stuff, uh, you know, that's something necessarily uh, that we can't teach our clients. That, that's kind of up to the client to yeah. make sure that the people are trained uh, and knowledgeable and, mm -hmm. and uh, reduce the turnover because yeah. most products are so complicated today that if you have employees just constantly being turned over because you don't pay enough or you don't treat them nicely, which is a lot of cases most of the time th then you're not going to have that knowledge so what i always say is don't be penny wise and pound foolish if you have someone who's experienced who can build relationships uh make sure that you keep them because if they go to your competitors it's going to be a double double whammy yeah and uh do you see uh and find that in most cases people really don't know their stuff today it, it it depends on the on the business. Listen, I uh, I remember years ago we did a, a study for you know a consumer product company and the the representative who had the highest scores was somebody who was new. But in asking the customer because it was a telephone interview why you loved this rep, they said, well, she was patient, she was caring, she gave a full explanation no matter what. So. Uh, you know, I, I, people, people do, you know, people do value that, you know, they don't want to be rushed off the phone. Uh, they want to feel that you're the only one. And if you're not the only one, I mean, if it's a, a case where you have to handle multiple people at once, then especially like in a, in a hospitality retail environment, have little bottles of water around or, or take off their coat or offer to put, a, to put their bags away. These are all things that will make somebody feel more comfortable until you're able to give them, you know, your total attention, whether it's business or whether it's consumer related. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Once again, it's those little things showing that you actually care about that person, right? I mean, most businesses, you know, do trade shows and so many times, you know, someone walks to a, up to a, a booth and there's 10 people there and, you know, the way people are welcomed and, and the way you, you know, handle multiple people at once, it, it's a critical step. You know, you're spending all this money on the trade show, make sure that you have the right people there that know how to engage and know how to uh, possibly, uh, you know, re-communicate with those people and having those people want to do that because of the way they were, you know, made to feel welcome in the first place. Yeah. And we get to the next critical step, which is don't tell me no. Right. Uh, I may, don't tell me no number five, but it could have been number eight or it could have been number one. Uh, no is, uh, no, which is actually a two letter word, 
is the same as a seven letter word, uh, which is goodbye. Yeah. So when you say no, your customers hear goodbye. You don't want to do business with me. Uh, so what I always say, and a lot of times I have a set of dominoes, uh, a picture of a dominoes behind yeah. me when I talk about this, that even if you've done a great job of making the customer feel welcome, giving them your full attention, answer more than their question, you know your stuff. When you say no, all those four steps fall like a set of dominoes and basically you have to restart, which is probably going to be very difficult. So mm -hmm. too many businesses say no. And, uh, you know, it, it's just, it infuriates the customer, especially when they're a loyal customer. You know? Yeah. Um, so that whole notion of how can I help you? Right, which gets around this whole issue of telling them no, because there probably is something you can do, even if perhaps you can't fully satisfy their need there, uh, there are things you could do to help them. No, absolutely, and, and I'll tell you, when I, when I was a general manager of ADP, it was the easiest job, because if, if any customer, which I hope they didn't get to me, but if they did get to me, I could solve their problem. All you have to do is say yes, as a matter of fact. Uh, one of my banks, you know, recently, uh, because of an error, you know, had a charge, which I thought was ridiculous after 21 years. And I said to the teller, you know what, somebody is eventually going to say yes, and I'm going to find out who that person is. Yeah, yeah. So why, why, why are you telling me no? Because eventually someone, you know, is going to say yes. So, so of course, this is a, a branch of a pretty big bank and the associate uh, proceeds to tell me that his maximum authority is $35. 35. So here, you, here yeah. you have an associate at a bank. I'm sure he's getting a very decent salary and there's space and there's facilities and you're marketing to all these people to get new customers. And this associate can only approve up to $35. And then of course he brings his assistant manager who now she can approve up to $70. So the story behind that is don't, wow. don't start giving approvals of $35 to your people because I don't think it's a very good you know, system. So uh, Yeah, and you're right. Eventually you will get to somebody who will take care of the matter. Yes, so and why go through then, all those steps for the customer or for the company, you know, it just doesn't make sense. It makes no sense. And the cost of involving all these people up the chain right? To get to that individual. When you add it all up, it just doesn't make sense. And it really says, you know, we don't trust those people on the front line. You know, I think there's a story in my book, I forget which company, but there was a president of a company who said, never say no. And one of the reasons why he said that is because sometimes customers ask mm -hmm. for something and we should be selling it. Maybe it's a new service or a new product, you know, that we should be, uh, you know, offering. So uh, yeah. don't say no, or make sure that it that it goes through several steps. And don't, I, I gave uh, actually a talk to the uh, International Premium Cigar and Pipe Association, yeah. trade show in Las Vegas. It was 800 people smoking cigars when I was wow. giving my presentation. <laughs> it was, but they were very nice. But at the end, someone said, what if you absolutely positively have to say no? And I said, you know what? Never say no on the spot. Always say, let me check. Uh, and mm -hmm. if it has to be no, at least people know that you you evaluated or you thought about it and they're not gonna be as angry as if you just say no on the spot. Yep, you took the time to dig in. And so um, the next step is invite me to return. Yes, and invite me to return. That's the pivotal piece of the repeat business. Of all the eight steps, that's the one uh, that if the chain is broken there, you're not going to generate repeat business. Yeah. So that is telling the customer that you want to see them again based on the story that you uncovered. So, uh, and, and in so many cases, it's great that it could be personal. So if it's a business client and they tell you they're going, or their daughter's getting married, you know, in a week and they're really busy, then say, you know what? Uh, I want to take you out to lunch uh, after the wedding, because I want to see the pictures and I want to hear about the wedding and how it went or your European vacation. Uh, it's telling the, if you don't tell the customer that you want to see them again, 
they think that you don't. And in the consumer world, whether it's a restaurant or whatever, matter of fact, I, I like to use restaurants because uh, people can relate to it. But uh, in New York, uh, where my wife and I live, there's, yeah. I think, 11,400 restaurants. And we live near Union Square, so there's 500 we can walk to. Great area. And uh, one day we walked into this restaurant called City Crab, which is no longer there, but for a totally different reason. And the food was great and the prices were reasonable and our waiter engages just enough to know that we lived in the neighborhood but by, by the way which is key anybody who owns a restaurant that doesn't know if the people are live in the neighborhood or not yeah. is, is is not being uh, too smart or not leveraging the opportunity there and uh when the check came there was a telephone number written on the check and our waiter was iran and he said you know what I enjoyed waiting on you today. I basically want to be your waiter for life. Every time you want a reservation, just uh, uh, text me and I will make the reservation and you will sit in my section. And over the next five years before it was turned over to another restaurant, uh, we must have gone there at least 150 or 200 times. Even though we went to other restaurants, we knew that our favorite restaurant, our favorite waiter uh, was always going to be there. And he hugged us and you know, it, it makes a difference. And yeah. <clears throat> I any never business, ever any business can have customers for life if they tell the customer they want want them to be a customer for life. Yeah, I, you know, I have never had an experience with a waiter like that over time. I've had people be very warm when we come back cuz you know, we certainly frequent places. Um, but, but that's my accident. So that's the whole purpose of the eight steps. I mean, you're you're hitting the key point you need a proactive strategy. If it's by accident and you have great service, you still might generate repeat business. But if you have great service and you have a proactive process, you're gonna be much more successful. Yeah, yeah, another, that is just another great story. Um, and you know, the story of the woman who was helping you at Nordstrom and left and they failed to really put somebody in to replace that relationship. These are all very, very telling because they're real life. And this is how it works, especially in a world where everybody's fighting over the customer. So I think this ties into the next step, which is show me I matter, right? Right. Yeah, show me I matter is, is all about, you know, keeping in touch with the customer after the sale. And um, I, I think that in, in a business, environment where it's uh we have business clients it's not only going out and seeing the clients on a regular basis and most companies do that it's also asking the companies questions that are going to create a dialogue so one of the reasons why i was so successful at adp is i did create uh, uh their entire account manager program mm -hmm. and i taught the account managers uh that it's important not just to go see the client but mm -hmm. to engage the client so that's how I kind of got into the survey business. Not that it was a survey, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. our clients, even today, I help them develop maybe 40 or 50 open-ended questions that they can ask their clients about their business, about their industry. And you don't ask all 40 or 50 at one time, but maybe once a year you do this client assessment. So what these questions do is they do show the customer or client that you care about them. And you're also finding out great insights. And the last part of that is, it helps to create a closer relationship with the client. So going out and seeing clients is great, but if you're getting feedback from them on a regular basis, that will show them that you matter. Uh, and on this B2C side, uh, I'm, get, rid of, get rid of emails and, you know, I, I, an email can be personal, but it just doesn't make sense that people have to unsubscribe to your email because it's, it's perceived as junk. So, yeah. Uh, listen, I, I interviewed a very successful retailer once and he said, I, I said, tell me what's most important. He said, there is no substitution for a handwritten note. So I know I've, I have a terrible handwriting, so I write really nice emails, but there is no substitution, whether it's a B2C customer or B2B customer, uh, that once in a while you write him a note or send him a nice greeting card or something like that. That does make yeah. a difference. And boy, does that stand out in a day and age where everything is electronic, everything. And yeah, uh, more important, more important than ever. And maybe that ties into the last step, which is uh, surprise me, right? 
Sure. So, uh, you know, most businesses do have the 80 20 rule where, you know, 80% of your business comes from 20% of your customers. Uh, even Macy's, by the way, who frankly I don't think is doing very well. Uh, but they issued a statistic recently that 46% of their business comes from 9% of their customers. So even though it's not 80-20, you know, they do have a significant pool of customers that are loyal. So it's important that you have a process. Uh, and I always tell the story how uh, Levi Strauss was one of my clients in the 1990s and I went out to San Francisco and they put me in this uh, luxury hotel uh, and it was great service. And uh, uh, you know, the second time I went back, as soon as I came back, they knew my name. Uh, they said, thank you so much, Mr. Shapiro, for you know booking again at our hotel. And Levi Strauss is one of our largest clients. And I just want to let you know that we've upgraded you to a suite. And within wow. seconds, I was in that suite. And there was a, a basket of fruit and wine with a handwritten note. Uh, Mr. Shapiro, we appreciate it was the Pan Pacific Hotel that you're here today. And the point of that story is that they had a process in place. They did yeah. not, I did not walk up to the desk and they didn't start searching if they had a suite for me. They knew before I was gonna come in, they were gonna award me and surprise me in good ways. And I just came back from a, a, a consulting assignment in Charleston, South Carolina. And one of the learnings that the uh, president said he was most significant for him is, he realized they had no process in place to surprise customers in good ways. Hmm. So whether it's a brand new customer or a customer who has a problem or some of your best customers, think of things. And they don't have to be, sometimes I just show a picture of a, a Cracker Jack box. It doesn't have to be a significant thing. It could be that uh, their daughter got married and you send them a really nice wedding card, even. you know, not necessarily a gift. So yeah, but talk about this and think about a process. <clears throat> and it's, you know, being conscious that you should do this. Absolutely. Because people, people don't really consciously think about this. They go through these interactions and they're reacting to things. They're not being proactive in many cases. Or and they, you know, a lot of times people say, well, we used to do that, but we don't do it anymore. We used to ask clients uh, questions, but we don't do We used to do this. We used to do that. So that happens in any business, I'm just saying, but it's important, especially with your customers, that it's consistent. Yeah. So, look, I love, uh, I love how human these eight steps are because it is about people. And I think everybody should really, you know, study this, get the eight steps, go to the, you know, go to your website. And, um, you know, one of the interesting things is if they actually get your book, they could go through and use the kind of the interview or, 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 you know, assessment that you have at the end for seeing how well the client relationships really are doing, right? Across these. Yes. Uh, I purposely in the book uh, included like a scorecard. So there's two elements for every step. So I think it's 16, you know, questions and everybody does some kind of survey, by the way, surveys uh, are great, but everybody hates them because people just abuse them and send them too yeah. often. But, you know, once a year or something, if you incorporate these eight questions or eight elements into your survey, it can make a dramatic difference on how you're, you know, getting the feedback from your customers to really see how vulnerable or, or the opportunities are to further increase, you know, either uh, market share from your existing business customers or wallet share from your existing, you know, consumers. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the book is available also on ePrint and audio as well. So I just mm -hmm. want to let your audience know. Yeah, uh, audio books are so popular. You know, people spend so much time driving in the car and doing things that uh, this is a, certainly a good read. Um, and that audio book's available via Amazon? Yes. And matter of fact, uh, I was very fortunate, of course, through a relationship that I got one of the number one narrators in the world. His name is Scott Brick who did The Firm and a lot of Nelson DeMille novels. And he doesn't normally do business books, but as a favor to me, he did it. And it's just a, a great reading. And I'll tell you, he did my first book and I was so happy, you know, that he did it. And, and then uh, when my second book came out, I said, Scott, uh, can you do me a favor? I mean, of course I paid him, you know, he said, you know, Rich, 
he said, it's not a favor. He said, I learned so many things from your first book that I've implemented in my business. So I felt really good about that. So not only did he read it, he understood it and digested it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, Got a lot of value. (laughs) And leverage it. So listen, I really appreciate you coming on. I think, you know, everybody should be aware of the customer, what the customer is thinking, and they should be doing everything to retain the customers they have. Do you have any parting thoughts or things you want to share with the audience before we go? Uh, well, I think it's tied into, um, you know, people productive about, you know, optimizing, you know, the human experience. Uh, too many people think AI is the answer to everything and, and AI is not the answer to everything. So, uh, unfortunately with the Boeing Max, you know, 737, yeah. uh, you know, do you really want to put, you know, your customers, which are your biggest asset, uh, you just want to put them over in the slot of AI. No, I think you want to put them over in the slot of the human connection. The Harvard Business Review recently did a study, and I think it was last year, and it's one of the few studies that exists just demonstrating the value, especially in retail, of the, of the sales associate. And too many companies are doing the Amazon, you know, cashier less store, and yeah. To me, that's relationship less store. So don't take the relationship out of the interaction. Uh, I think you're making a terrible mistake, whether you're a business or whether you're, uh, you know, in a consumer related business. So treat people well, make sure you have enough staff. And, uh, and, and if, if once in a while your business is going to have a problem, you know, they're going to do something wrong. But if you have great people and a great culture, then customers are still going to want to stay with you. So Richard, thank you so much. Great interview. You have incredible life experience, so many interesting stories. I'm, I'm always wowed by, you know, how many incredibly good stories you have to share on this topic that are real and just so important. So by the way, if anybody does want, you know, my website is uh, tcfcr.com. Yeah, uh, so the company is the Center for Client Retention. So it's the initials of my company. I know people tell me your company name is too long, but it's hard for me to change it after 32 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But and I, you got a great I, URL though, right? Excuse me? You have a great URL. Most people have these long ones because everything was taken. You know, www.longwellname.com and you got the TC, right? FCR. TCFCR. TCFCR. Center for Client Retention. So easy to go to. And yeah, I recommend everybody uh, really go there, acquaint themselves more deeply with material practices and know that you're available if anybody wants help. No, absolutely. I appreciate the time. and I appreciate you coming on. It's uh, right. fantastic that you made the time. I know how incredibly busy you are. So thank you for sharing kind of your life experience, thoughts, and practices with the audience. My Have a great pleasure. one.